What we need what is not need more medication, more medication but more education, more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria every Monday on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyami. Don't forget, don't forget don't what we need what is we not need more, medication, more medication, but more but education more because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Expose with Tony Akiyami, brought to you by TSF, the Shepherd's Flock International Church. And this comes to you every Monday, 8 p.m. West African time on YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. Our axiom is what we need is not more medication, but more education. And we bring to you in this particular season on Expose with Tony Akiyami, your water and your health. We have looked at various aspects of this particular topic. Uh, we closed last week looking at the dangers of dehydration, and we identified the three uh, evil geniuses that contribute to chronic degenerative health conditions and various health attacks. And they are, number one, dehydration, number two, sleep deprivation, and number three, stress. Now, you may not be able to do something, you know, by yourself, for yourself when it comes to managing stress. There may be things beyond your control when it comes to stress management. For example, the demands of your job may be something beyond your personal control. You may not be the only one to dictate how things flow when it comes to your work. You may not be able to dictate your sleep pattern, whether when to fall asleep and when to wake up. For example, there are times I want to sleep, I lay down in bed, but sleep is not coming. And I wish that sleep were just a switch that I could flip. I just switch it off and I go to sleep. And when I want to wake up, I switch it on and I come back. But it's not like that. It's more complicated than that. When it comes to stress management, when it comes to sleep deprivation or ability to fall asleep, stay asleep and wake up refreshed, Yes, there are things we can do for ourselves in those regards, but they are not 100% under our control. There are things that others may have to do for us as sleep aids or to help us manage our stress. But one of the three, the one that is absolutely under our control is hydration. The problem of dehydration can be tackled and addressed by you without the help of any other person. All you need to do is to know that you have to drink water know the type of water to drink, and become deliberate, become intentional in drinking water. Have a water bottle that you carry around. Have something that will remind you that you have to drink water, okay? Out of the three problems, dehydration, sleep, and stress, the one that is so easy to control absolutely by you is that of hydration, all right? So knowing that it's absolutely under your control, you cannot give any excuse or offer any alibi why you are not drinking enough water. Today, we want to start off by looking at the things that cause dehydration. Now, Dr. Norman Walker made a statement, and I want to quote him. He says, the most dehydrated people on earth are those who live on massive quantities of processed cereals, bread, and meat, drinking very little water, except perhaps in their coffee or tea or in soft drinks, unquote by Dr. Norman W. Walker, DSC. I quote that statement again because you need to really process it. You need to think about it very deeply. He says, the most dehydrated people on earth are those who live on massive quantities of processed cereals, bread, and meat, drinking very little water, except perhaps in their coffee or tea or in soft drinks. I have alluded to this over and over again. Some people are addicted to coffee, thinking that they are getting plenty of water into themselves by drinking coffee. Some people are addicted to lager beer, alcohol, thinking that after all, 
the beer they are drinking has a lot of water in it. But the reality is that coffee and alcohol are diuretics. They take more water out of your body than the water that comes into your body by drinking a cup of coffee or a cup of beer. Now, this is another reason people get dehydrated. So people get dehydrated by eating processed cereals, processed flour products, processed meats like corn, uh, corned beef, like ham, like sausage, like hot dog and what have you. Those are processed meats. And then they drink very little water, except they take coffee, they take tea, they take soft drinks, they take beer, and that's all they do. They don't drink water. That's why people get dehydrated. A few people drink adequate amounts of water daily. Very few people. And this is one of the reasons that many are dehydrated. They just don't get to drink water. Meanwhile, we expel water from our bodies in many ways. So we need to constantly replenish, particularly those of us who are living in the tropical regions of the world. In Nigeria and in West Africa in particular, in the last couple of months, the heat has been something else. Very, very extremely warm weather. I mean, sometimes I am in my house and I'm just in my shirt only and I am still sweating. If I move out of the sitting room or my bedroom or my study, and I just get out to other places within my house where the air conditioner is not on, then I'm sweating because of the extreme heat and I'm losing a lot of water. So if I don't replenish, I get dehydrated. So those of us living in tropical and very warm climates, you know, we lose extraordinary amounts of water because of heat. And we particularly need to top up our water regularly, okay? So the next question then will be, how much water do I need to drink per day? How much water? Well, opinions differ from expert to expert, but I'll give some general guidelines. First, I will suggest that you drink a minimum of eight glasses of water daily, particularly those of us living in the tropics, a minimum of eight glasses of water. Now you might say there are different sizes of glasses. Yeah, the average size of a glass is eight ounces or 240 ml or 24 cl, whichever one you're familiar with. 24 cl or 240 ml or eight ounces of water. That's the average size of a glass. Okay, uh, bottled water in Nigeria comes in bottles of uh, 50 cl, 75 cl, 1.5 liters. That's the one I'm familiar with, okay? So if you buy a 50 cl bottle of water, that would be two glasses. If you buy a 75 cl of water or 750 ml of water, that would be three glasses. So like I said again, an average glass is simply eight ounces or 240 ml or 24 cl. Now, some experts propose that you drink water half your body weight in pounds, in ounces of water. Now, for example, if you weigh 100 pounds in weight, that's your body weight when you stand on the scale, okay, 100 pounds. Then you divide that by two. That will give you 50. Then you drink 50 ounces of water daily. 50 ounces of water, if you divide that by eight, that will give you like six glasses on the average, because a glass is eight ounces. So six glasses would be 48 ounces, all right? So 50 ounces is like six glasses if you're weighing 100 pounds. Now, how do you convert pounds to kilograms if you're not familiar with pounds? One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if you weigh 100 kilograms, that means you're weighing 220 pounds. Okay, if you weigh 50 kilograms, that means you are weighing 110 pounds. So you can convert your kilograms, if you stand on the scale and you are weighing like 80 kilograms, for example, you multiply 80 by 2.2, and that will give you your weight in pounds. And then you divide your weight in pounds by two, 
And that gives you the amount of ounces of water that you're supposed to drink. For example, if you're weighing, uh, let's say, 80 kilograms, another way to calculate the amount of water to drink is to multiply 80 by 1.1. 80 by 1.1, that will give you 88. So you drink 88 ounces of water. If you are weighing 50 kilograms, multiply 50 by 1.1, that will give you 55. And that means you drink 55 ounces of water. That's a very straightforward one, isn't it? You can either divide your weight in ounces by two to get the amount of ounces of water to drink, your weight in pounds, your body weight in pounds, divided by two, and whatever figure you get in ounces of water, that's the amount of water you're supposed to drink. If you are, your weight is in kilograms, simply multiply it by 1.1, and whatever figure you get, that is the number of ounces of water you're supposed to drink. I think I've made it very easy for you. So if you're weighing 50 kg, once again, multiply 50, by 1.1, and that gives you 55 ounces of water per day. Very straightforward, is it? This is a good place to clap for me there. <laughs> now, how much water do I drink a day? Now, water is not just meant to quench our thirst, let me repeat. In fact, we shouldn't wait until we are thirsty before we drink water. Thirst is simply a red light on our dashboard, meaning that our radiator water is too low. And you know that a good car driver will top his radiator water before the red light shows. If you wait for the red light to show before you top the water, that, is not, that means you're not a good driver. You're not taking good care of your vehicle. Similarly for your body, if you wait until you are thirsty before you drink water, then you're not taking good care of your body. Now, the entire water in our body today, all the amount of water that you have in your body right now as I'm speaking to you, that amount of water would have been completely replaced in the next five to 10 days. The water in your body now in the next five to 10 days will have completely been, you know, gone. Either evaporated or urinated or poo-pooed or breathed out. One way or the other word, or sweated out, it will leave your body and it must have been replenished by another batch of water. So we need to keep drinking water or eating juicy fruits and vegetables to replenish our water. Also, we need more water in the early morning when we wake up. Why? Because you were asleep all night, let's say for six to eight hours, and you lost a lot of water during that six to eight hour period without replenishing, maybe. You probably woke up once or twice in the middle of the night to urinate, and you lost water. You were breathing all through the night, and through your breathing, you also lost water. And those of us who are in the tropics, sometimes when we are sleeping, we are even sweating, losing water. So when you wake up in the morning, the best thing to do is to replenish that water you lost overnight by drinking approximately two glasses of water. That's 16 ounces, okay, of water. First thing in the morning when you get up to rehydrate before you start putting any other thing into your body. But I must caution that you are not necessarily supposed to flood your body with a gallon of water first thing in the morning, as some people practice. They call it water therapy. And they will drink a whole gallon, four liters of water in the morning. I think that is too much. You are flooding your body by doing that, okay? You put your body into water evacuation mode, as I normally say. As your body, you know, senses that the body has been flooded. When you put one gallon of water inside at a go, your body feels that the body has been flooded. And then it will switch into evacuation mode to flush out, you know, this flood of water very rapidly. So you keep going to the toilet very often to eliminate this excess water from your body. Now, another question that people normally ask is, should I drink warm water or cold water? When we come back from this short break, we're going to be starting from there. Don't forget, what we need is not more medication, but more education. For the best prescription is knowledge. Again, this is Exposé with Tony Akinyemi, brought to you by TSF Church. That is the Shepherd's Flock International Church. I'll see you after this short break. 
Don't go away. Welcome back. This is still Expose with Tony Akinyemi, brought to you by TSF, the Shepherd's Flock International Church. What we need is not more medication, but more education for the best description. prescription is knowledge. To be informed is to be transformed. To be uninformed is to be deformed. We are dealing with your water and your health during this season of Expose. And we're looking at water. How much of it should we drink? We just answered that in the first half of today's episode. And in this second half, we will commence by looking at what type of water should I drink? Okay, let's begin with the first part of that question. Should it be warm or cold or room temperature? Now, the best way to drink water is preferably at room temperature. Now, we certainly shouldn't drink very cold water with our meals. Of course, we can drink refrigerated water between meals if you feel hot and you want to cool down. You can drink refrigerated water because it helps to cool us down in extremely hot weather. However, we should not drink water that is too cold. It's not the best for our body, especially our truth. All right, let me just take a sip of my water one more time. Great. Now, we shouldn't drink too much water with our meals so that our stomach pH is not altered significantly in order not to deactivate digestive enzymes that we digest our food. Enzymes are both pH sensitive and thermosensitive. So you drink much of your water when you are not eating, not during meals. That's very important. Now, let's go on to the next Question, what type of water should we drink? First of all, let's start by looking at or identifying sources of water. Now, natural water comes from either springs or wells or boreholes or rivers or streams or lakes or from rainfall. And in fact, I was in one school, I mean the high school that my son attended in Nigeria, they had a system installed in the school where they had this device just in the open, in the premises, that takes vapor from the atmosphere and condenses it into water and channels it into a faucet indoors where people could just take water and drink. I mean, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Water from the atmosphere. <laughs> The device is installed in the compound, just in the open compound on the field. And it just takes water in the atmosphere, vapor, water vapor in the atmosphere, condenses it into liquid, and then channels it inside. And they can open the tap inside and drink clean, purified water from there. That was the first time I saw that kind of technology. And so we can get water from the air if you look at that technology as well. Now, so. Water is classified into various types based on a number of factors. Number one, the source of the water. Where is the water coming from? Number two, the mineral content of the water. Number three, the level of purity of the water. Number four, the pH of the water, and so on and so forth. You know, these are all the different, uh, different parameters to that they use, that scientists use to classify 
different types of water. Now, so uh, I will progress now to look at different types of water based on these parameters I have mentioned. So we will look at the first type, which is called saline water or salt water. Now, saline water is generally from the ocean. If you go to the ocean, we have the Atlantic Ocean as our backyard here in Lagos. Okay, if you go to the Atlantic Ocean and you dip your cup inside and take some water, although I don't encourage you to do that, if you taste it, it is salty because it's saline water. Ocean water is salt water, okay? The salt content is too concentrated, so it's not good for drinking. Neither is it good for cooking or for washing. Of course, we also have saline water that they use in transfusing patients in the hospital. That's water with electrolytes inside, salt and maybe sugar, okay? So that's called saline water. But we are talking of natural water now. We're not talking about the one that human beings have prepared in the lab. Now, the second type of water is the one described as hard water, hard. Now, hard water is water that contains very heavy, you know, amounts of minerals and metals and other substances, okay? Most uh, uh, types of hard water will contain excessive lime salts, carbonates and sulfates of calcium and magnesium. Now, according to Dr. Allen Barnick, Alan E. Bannick, on page eight of his book, which he titled, The Choice is Clear. He said, and I quote, practically all kinds of bottled water is hard water, according to Dr. You know, Alan Bannick. So when you take your water from your well, from your borehole, most of them will have minerals dissolved in them, and that makes them hard water. I recall when I just, uh, my wife and I just moved to our house, we, we, we sank a borehole there, and we got samples of water from the borehole, and we sent it to the lab of the Water Corporation of Lagos State in Nigeria for them to analyze the water for us. And we found out that the iron content of the water was so high that it would be risky, to be dangerous for us to use that water to cook or to drink. So we had to find a way to purify that water so we can use it for cooking and for drinking. All right, even for our laundry, we still had to do some level of outdoor purification before it finally enters the building, before the water enters the building. We purify it somewhat so that it will not waste our detergent, our soap in laundry because if water is hard, it doesn't make your soap to foam very well. So you use a lot of detergents to get little effect, okay? That's hard water, okay? So purifying your water to soften it is a good one. And when water is, hard water is, uh, when you remove what makes it hard from it, then it becomes the third type of water, which is soft water. Soft water has less minerals and substances in it than hard water. But it is, in most cases, not totally free of these elements that they are there in low amounts, okay? Tolerable amounts. The fourth type of water, natural water, is Atesian water or mineral water. Now, this type of water is found in nature and contains an abundance of one or more mineral elements. Now, but those mineral elements are usually the ones that are useful to the human body. Zinc, calcium, magnesium, in quantities that are not harmful to the body. And the minerals usually make that type of water, artesian water, alkaline. Artesian water is found usually in uh, deep in aquifers. When people sink, you know, boreholes deep, 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 deep down into the ground, into the aquifers, they can strike uh, artesian water. We have, I think, one in Ogun State in Nigeria, you know, bordering Lagos State, when you are exiting from Lagos State and entering into Ogun State on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, there is a location there where they struck an aquiva and Atesian water is coming out from there. Okay. Uh, then the fifth type of water is rainwater. Now, rainwater is supposed to be the purest form of water before atmospheric contaminants begin to get into it as it falls through the atmosphere. But once atmospheric contaminants, 
get into rainwater, then it's no longer as pure as it should be. But when it is just, you know, dropping from the clouds, it's the purest form of water. But as it passes through the atmosphere, it can get contaminated, depending on what was floating in the atmosphere before it passes through it. Sometimes rainwater also falls on the roof and it washes all kinds of dirt and dust from the roof uh, before coming down. Then most people collect their rainwater from what is dropping from their roof. Okay, and that means that the water has been contaminated before they collected it. So do not just think that rainwater is pure, therefore you collect rainwater and you can just drink straight like that. All right? The sixth type of water, well, is municipal water. That's the water from, from the water corporation, if you like, of your state or of your city. We call it in Nigeria tap water. <laughs> That's the popular way we describe it in the local parlance, tap water. Now, it's water supplied from the government to our homes. And usually, this municipal water is usually chlorinated and or fluoridated. Yeah, either chlorinated and fluoridated. In other words, they add chlorine to kill germs, and then they add fluoride in the hope that it can help to strengthen our teeth. All right, for me, the chlorination and the fluoridation actually uh, contaminate the water. The seventh type of water which we normally use in our homes in this part of the world is boiled water. Now, when you boil your water, you kill the germs in the water, and that's good. But it does not remove dissolved minerals or contaminants for that matter. Now, Dr. Alan Bannick also wrote in his book, he says, and I quote, while raw water is an aquarium filled with deadly microorganisms, boiled water is a graveyard of dead germs. So one is an aquarium, one is supposed to be a mortuary <laughs> or a graveyard, as it were. Raw water that is not boiled may have microorganisms in them, E. coli, salmonella, what have you, all right? Deadly microorganisms, like fish swim swimming in an aquarium. But when you boil the water, you kill them, they're all dead. So they become either a graveyard or they become a mortuary, right? Now, number eight is filtered water. This is water that has been filtered through a very fine strainer, carbon filter, or other forms of filters. Now, filters usually don't, you know, filter out bacteria and viruses and other colloidal substances in water, but at least they remove certain things, and it's better than doing nothing. The ninth type of water is deionized water. Deionization is a process of water purification that effectively removes minerals from water but does not remove synthetic chemicals such as herbicides, pesticides, industrial solvents, and even microorganisms. And then we have water in raw edible plants. Like when you eat fresh fruits and raw vegetables in vegetable salads or in smoothies or vegetable juices, you know, every type of juice that you drink like that, fresh plant juice, maybe you juice tubers or fruits or vegetables, or nuts, you make tiger nut milk, for example, almond milk, coconut milk, what have you. Now, the juice you are drinking has between 50% and 95% of water. So that's a source of water from raw plants. The 11 type is steam distilled water. We'll come to that in greater details in a later episode by the special grace of God. Now, the purest form of water is supposed to be distilled water. It's just like rainwater. But then, this one doesn't get contaminated because it's not passing through the atmosphere. Now, for kidney dialysis machines, they use only distilled water, for example, because chemicals in other forms of water, especially chlorine and fluoride in chlorinated and fluoridated water, have adverse effects on kidney patients. Now, three people died in the Chicago Teaching Hospital in 1973 after their dialysis equipment failed to remove fluoride in the drinking water before it was used during a dialysis procedure. So every laboratory experiment is carried out with distilled water. If you boil distilled water in your kettle for years, there will be no calcium or mineral deposit to coat the inside of your kettle, unlike other types of water, like hard water. Distilled water is, however, aggressive because of its acidic nature, because all minerals have been removed, along with all contaminants. So the pH is lowered, so it becomes acidic and more reactive. Then we have alkaline water. 
This water is an, uh, has an alkaline pH, a pH that is above 7. Typically, alkaline water has a pH of between 7.5 and 9.5 uh, pH. Now, if you're familiar with Kangen water, you must have heard about pH of water. Kangen water actually helps to increase the pH of the water, thereby creating alkaline water through electrolysis, which is the water that is rich in hydrogen, you know, and what have you. We we'll talk about that again by the grace of God in a later episode. Then you have structured water. This is also known as wet water because of its high bioavailability. The body can absorb it better than regular water. So it hydrates the body so well because the body absorbs it, absorbs it well. Now, the molecules in structured water have what they call a crystalline structure. So a water revitalizer or a bio disc, for example, is required to make structured water. So you have dry water, which is regular water, then wet water, which is what structured water is, that the body can, you know, absorb very well. This is how far we will go today. Uh, next time, in the next episode, God willing, we will commence with water pollutants and contaminants, the various things that pollute water and contaminate water to make them no longer suitable for drinking or cooking but maybe it can be used for other purposes. And even then, when they are used for other purposes, they can still cause problems, particularly when you use them in agricultural, for agricultural purposes, it can still contaminate the ground, okay? So we'll look at water pollutants and contaminants. That is where we're going to start from uh, in the next episode. Stay with us in this series on your water and your health. Again, this is brought to you courtesy TSF. The Shepherd's Flock International Church. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akiemi is my name. What we need is not more medication, but more education. For the best prescription is knowledge. When you are informed, you are transformed. When you are uninformed, you could be deformed. I love you. Have a very beautiful week ahead. God bless you.